Good morning, cybersecurity nerds, and welcome back to Las Vegas, Nevada. We're here on day two of our coverage at Black Hat. My name is Savannah Peterson. Delighted to be joined with John Furrier today. John, it's been such a cool show. Day two is going to kick off. We've got a full schedule, a lot of action happening yeah. here. It's been amazing. I'm really pleasantly surprised. I feel like I've learned a lot and had some <laughs> fascinating conversations. Speaking of, very excited to have one of those to kick us off today. MK, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It it's is a pleasure. such a pleasure. You're a CUBE veteran. <laughs> we just discovered that, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Six years ago. So you've been with us for the long haul. We appreciate that. Absolutely. You've got two really interesting roles. Actually, I suspect you wear many more hats than that. But you're the president of Cyversity, and you're also at the office of the CISO at Google. Correct. When do you sleep? Uh, I don't. Uh, <laughs> and, and my family complains about me having uh, probably taken up too much of my bandwidth with, uh, with work. But these are things that I feel passionate about, things that I feel like I have to be a contributor to in the, uh, in the space. Uh, and so we make time for uh, for those efforts. You know, my primary job with Google and then the work that I'm doing with Cyversity, all both very important to me. I want to talk about that a little bit because I know you did a panel discussion this morning Correct. on diversity, focusing on the power of diversity as a defense against attackers and, and, yeah. and sitting in the, the importance of that. I want to give you a moment to have your platform here and talk about that. So tell us about Cyversity and tell us, Tell us why it's so important in security to have diversity. So uh, we've been grappling with this workforce challenge in cybersecurity now for the better part of a decade plus, right? We, we recognize that the people that we bring into the industry have enormous responsibilities. And quite frankly, there's not enough of them in the pipeline to ensure that every organization has a robust cybersecurity apparatus. And so the position of organizations like Cyversity really is that we all need to, as an industry, open up our optic and lens to include uh, people that come from various backgrounds that may not be your typical software developer, software engineer, folks that may not um, automatically be inclined to the work of cybersecurity, but both have an interest and inclination to dive into it and ability to study and learn the material. And so we're just trying to bring more folks to the table because we recognize that this problem, quite frankly, has to be solved within the cybersecurity community. I think that's so mission critical and congrats on all the work. I personally appreciate it as a woman representing some of the diversity in this arena. How do you recruit them? How are you finding your new members? Uh, that's not hard. Um, you know, when you put the word out that you're an organization that's interested in bringing folks to the table, we get a lot of people who sign up to become members of our organization. Like you know, we have, a, a, of course, an existing website at, Cy at cyversity.org. Um, we put on, it, during the course of any one particular year, a number of educational programs that help people to land and get that initial start into cybersecurity. Uh, and we don't do the training directly. We actually partner with the industry's best curriculum providers, and we have partnerships with a number of organizations like SAN, the SANS Institute, ISC2, uh, CompTIA. You know, we, we make sure that uh, the partnerships that we have Bring, tape, bring educational training and curriculum to the table that's valuable to our members. And so we have kind of a two-part thing. We're trying to bring folks in, get them the training that they need in order to be able to land jobs in cybersecurity, but we also want to place some emphasis around helping people sustain their careers in cybersecurity as well. And so we're now attaching to and developing partners that provide access to mid-level management training, executive training, and so we're trying to touch folks everywhere across the span of their cybersecurity career. Yeah, MK, last time you were on theCUBE, you were with the FBI, and then now you're at Google Cloud. You've seen a lot of the, the security challenges, and one of the things about uh, new talent, and I think we talked about briefly in our last conversation years ago, and, we, and it comes up on theCUBE all the time, cybersecurity is one of those fields where you don't really need a pedigree. I mean, Absolutely, it's a, it's a skill-based industry. It's also yeah. changing so fast. So right. a lot of people think, oh, I can't have a computer science degree or whatever. No, 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 no. Data science and cyber are the two fields where you could come in with a background that's not traditional right. and rise up. Talk about that impact, and, and what are you seeing from a skill standpoint? Because, again, sometimes the diversity in thought and also background helps solve the problem. It's a problem-solving yeah. thing. Talk about the, the skills required for the folks watching, that you don't need to go to the special schools or whatever. You can come in, if you're smart, you can come in at the ground running. You, you, you have to be inclined uh, and have an interest in the material. I am a perfect example that the skills necessary to thrive in a cybersecurity career can be taught. It was during my career in the government that I turned 
towards cybersecurity as part of my profession as a special agent in the FBI. And it was during that time that I had to go through all of the initial sort of start with the foundational pieces, work my way through the certifications, the, the, the pieces that will give you sort of that grounding foundation. And then when you take that and couple it with practical application in the job world, it's really a one-two punch. If you, can, if you can stomach the time that it takes to invest in certs, I'm a big believer in certifications. If you can take the time to stomach and invest the time into that and then apply some practical application to it, it really makes you a formidable candidate in the cybersecurity space. Is there space. a pattern in terms of skill set? I mean, like gamers or whatever, people who were like natural. What are the natural tendencies? Pro for problem solvers, people that are uh, super inquisitive, right? People who want to understand how things work. Um, and where problems, like the source of problems emanate from, tend to be good cybersecurity practitioners. It's this curious. idea, curious. It's yeah. this idea that you want to dig down yeah. until you discover what the problem was, and then you want to fix it. You, you yeah. want to you institute controls, you want to make changes in the operational or process of the organization so that the problem doesn't happen again. Uh, and those are all you know, skills that you can derive from a number of careers, which is why uh, folks who come from, in, you know, in my instance, government, who have you know, careers as investigators. We, I just left a conversation where we were talking about you know, prior journalists tend to make uh, uh, great cybersecurity practitioners because they, they have this idea of getting to the bottom, uh, the investigative, uh, uh, the side, investigative of the, side of the house, yeah. right? Getting to the bottom of things, the right? guys. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Update well, it, it comes down to passion, though. We had a conversation with Jackie from Cribble yesterday, and, and the theme that I hear in this community is you have to be passionate about it. Absolutely. Because the folks on the other side it's a grind. are passionate yeah. about it. Well, and they're, they're passionate about achieving their objective, which is all objective. The exactly. various objective, which is oftentimes to simply make money off of these transactional exploits that they engage in. I was just, yeah. is it, so you've worked in, a, you, you've had some cool jobs. I can imagine that the audience listening right now is like special agent at the FBI. He's in this very cool office at Google. He's also got this nonprofit going on. It's very, right. very awesome. Was it, Challenging to go from working for the government to working for a publicly traded Fortune 100 company? Um, so I, I worked 32 years in the U.S. government. Uh, I feel like I did my piece uh, for <laughs> uh, country and, and, and all. Um, I had you. always planned to spend a career in government, and so it had a, a, a shelf life to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I did it. I retired from service. It wasn't difficult because I feel like a lot of the skills that I developed over that 32-year span, especially in the area of leadership, are all applicable to the experiences that I'm having in the private sector. Talk about uh, the public-private partnerships. One of the things that's been in the hallway conversation here at Black Hat is a lot of the talent in the government and a lot of talent in the private sector are coming together. Absolutely. Um, can you share your your view on that? Because more than ever, sharing information obviously against mm -hmm. threats and, 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 and issues and vulnerabilities is huge uh, from zero days to, to threat actors. What's the public-private partnership landscape look like? What's the playbook? What's the success I, formula I, look like? Yeah, I, I think it's as good as it's ever been uh, because we recognize this is an all-hands-on-deck issue and that no one singular entity is going to be capable of solving sort of the cybersecurity landscape challenge. Government plays a role. They have a big piece to play in it. They're, they have observations and visibility into the landscape that are unique. Uh, and unlike most other organizations on the planet, and certainly um, the private sector plays an immense role in this as well. You know, I, I, I represent one of the biggest technology uh, firms on the planet. Uh, our visibility into the cyber threat landscape is unique as well. And so when you think about combining forces uh, between you know, the, uh, the big tech companies, um, private and public partnerships with government and otherwise, and nonprofit organizations, you begin to get to get this flywheel effect uh, where you're actually able to impact and, and make a difference in the industry. So it's immensely important. I think we don't solve the, the challenge without public-private partnerships, um, just because I don't think any one singular entity is capable of solving this. How's Google Cloud doing right now with the government and, and enterprise sector? Obviously, our data shows, obviously, the compute side's growing, all aspects of infrastructure and platforms and services growing significantly. Obviously, they've got the G Suite and all of the applications, but you know the infrastructure side is yeah. growing significantly. Well, what's Google Cloud up to? Yeah, so um, this is an area where we've made significant investments, uh, as we were talking before we came on camera here. In the past 12 months or so, we've made not only significant investments, but have come to market with uh, very specific products that are geared towards that highly sensitive data workload classification, this ability of 
uh, government entities, quite frankly, around the world to be able to avail themselves of the kinds of technology that Google Cloud brings to the table, but at the same time, be able to adhere to their significant classification requirements. And so we've got a couple of products in the market space right now that are getting quite a bit of traction in the way of our, uh, something we're calling Google Distributed Cloud and also our Assured Workloads product. We're seeing a lot of uptake across the global public sector with products like that that seem to be working for their needs. How, how has, I mean, it makes sense that everyone has to work together. These problems are too big and it's usually yeah. actually geopolitical as much as it is versus companies or bad actors. I'm curious, so with the, with the explosion of Gen AI over the last two years, how has that impacted your role? I mean, you started at Google three years ago just before right. this all this hype curve acceleration. So I'm curious, how has that made your job different? What are you uh, seeing? Uh, we're, we're super bullish on, on, obviously, generative AI and what impact we think it can have on not only um, uh, commercial enterprise, but also in the public sector. And there's lots of reasons for that. I think that we're seeing for the first time um, uh, from a defender standpoint, an ability of cybersecurity defenders to be much more proactive through the use of AI tools than they have been historically, which means that now they may very well either be able to match the adversarial activity and or extend their capabilities in a way that puts them on a proactive edge, which makes them better defenders. And so AI has this possibility uh, of turning the landscape into one where defenders for the very first time have um, uh, an ability to, to lean into cybersecurity in a way that makes it substantive and responsive to the needs of the organization. From an operational standpoint, uh, business operations, I can tell you that nearly every conversation that we have uh, on the commercial side with customers has a component of AI discussions. Companies want to know, how do we leverage right. this technology? How does it make us more efficient? What can we do? And those are things that they're learning uh, either through use cases that we're sharing with them or just in creative sessions trying to come up with problems that we can help them solve through this new technology that we really are seeing organizations um, become more efficient, deliver constituent services, certainly in the public sector space, uh, and just be uh, become more agile as organizations. I mean, Google Cloud can't be ignored. You guys are massive in size, growing significantly on the cloud front. Performance is there. Um, you know, we had Kevin Mandian on theCUBE uh, last year, and obviously Mandian was acquired by Google. Um, you can't ignore the fact that they're one of the best threat intelligence players out there. Globally known. Yeah. Um, amazing company, great group. Uh, we'll be covering their MYs coming up shortly. Yeah, so uh, Savannah will be there. Um, how has that impacted? Because Google's security and what you guys do with customers, now you got Mandian into the fold, yeah. must be a huge win in, in terms of what they bring to the table. How does that impact in the Google security posture and how does that help you with customers? Uh, it's a massive win for us. It allows Google Cloud for uh, the first time in its history to be able to essentially be of use to our customers across the entire cybersecurity life cycle, right? Uh, every use case that you can think of from planning strategically to how to build out cybersecurity programs and apparatus through the advisory work that Mandiant does all the way through uh, what we call, you know, the, the five now six pillars of the NIST cybersecurity framework we're there on the front end, we're there in the middle with detection and response, uh, and we're there at the end uh, in terms of being able to now send teams that can help organizations right size themselves after major security incidents. So it, it really is a bit of a game changer uh, for Google Cloud, and it now means that we get to compete in space uh, that historically we haven't been able to compete in. You know, MK, one of the things that came up yesterday, and it's been in conversation we've seen all the time in the industry, more acute than ever before here, is the role of policy around data and around right. security. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about yesterday, Savannah, around policy versus winging it. Oh, I'm, I think things are good versus this is the policy. Um, one gets fired if it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, right. if you don't, if you're on the wrong side of that. Um, what policies are coming, emerging that you see that are important for customers to kind of think, besides the basic you know, security posture, because the role of data is now more important than ever. You know, you talk about distributed computing, you got sovereign cloud, you got proprietary data, that's an asset where Genevieve is going to be part of. So you got data now management changing significantly. Right. And you got geographical issues. So how is policy um, being shaped? When I say policy, I don't mean like government policy, I mean like company policy around how to handle things from a CISO perspective. Yeah, I, I think um, you've probably touched on an area that's of great sensitivity for most commercial enterprise. Um, this is the area where I think they are spending the most time trying to get their hands wrapped around because of issues like data sovereignty, 
uh, the need to um, uh, contextually regionally ensure that data resides in, a, in any one particular place, that the access to the data is limited to a particular profile or persona within the companies for which they represent. Uh, and these are all challenges that we have engineered towards in order to be able to meet our customers where they are. But I do see the policy piece as being the, uh, the area where um, there's a lot of emphasis being placed on it, and this is one of those areas where, you know, when you th start thinking about AI uh, and its impact to enterprise, this is where companies are spending a tremendous amount of time trying to make sure they understand potential impact to enterprise, the change management necessary to incorporate uh, this new technology into the enterprise and effectively use it while adhering to their own internal policies. And so it's, it's, a, it's a representative challenge, but it's one certainly from yeah. the Google, you mentioned Google earlier, Cloud perspective that we can help there that you with. Think, you mentioned NIST earlier. Is there any yeah. groups that you think are, are, are any new, new things coming out from an industry standpoint that are relevant that people should pay attention to? Yeah, I mean, from the Google Cloud standpoint, we recently um, uh, launched a coalition um, that we're calling the Secure AI Framework Coalition, which is essentially uh, you know, we did a lot of the pioneering work on LLMs and we were the first to come to market with a framework that we thought might be helpful for organizations to adopt uh, artificial intelligence principles. And so this coalition brings together other enterprises uh, with an idea to create an industry voice and narrative around how organizations can develop policies, develop the frameworks internally necessary to adopt this new and uh, emerging technology. And so I think that announcement certainly uh, rings the bell on initiatives uh, around um, uh, new technology, uh, its potential impact, and how organizations need to get their heads wrapped around it. Wow, sounds like a lot of things are moving really fast and you're thinking about all of them with the right players. You bet. Which you is bet. very exciting. All right, last question for you, because it's been fantastic, and obviously we're going to have you on again. What do you hope to be able to say a year from now when we're back at Black Hat that you can't say today? If I can't say it today, how can I say it now? Well, see, I can tell that you used to work for the FBI because most people just walk into this question <laughs> without even realizing it. I mean, you're welcome to give me a, a, a secret, no, but it could I, be no. a progress in the market. A question no, with a question. Here, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good Here's, I know, I have an it. answer for that. One, yeah. and I'll take, uh, I'll take the two um, domains for which you guys invited me to have this conversation. One, uh, from the um, cybersecurity workforce standpoint, I hope to be able to say that organizations and our industry are making unique and demonstrative strides towards uh, increasing our ability to bring different folks into the cybersecurity space. Yes. Um, that is, uh, again, a passion topic for me and it's where I spend a significant amount of time. Um, on the um, just pure cybersecurity side, I would love to see more public sector organizations adopt new and emerging technologies in a much more rapid fashion to get ahead of what has historically been a, uh, a legacy of technology debt and inability to be agile uh, across the technology spectrum. Uh, and we're seeing it uh, piecemeal, but I would love to see more wide scale uh, adoption of new and emerging technology by public sector entities. Oh, I love that. I like both of those things. So I, I agree with those. I would love for us to be able to say that. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. Absolutely great. And John, always a pleasure as always. And thank all of you for tuning in to our two days of wonderful coverage here in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada at Black Hat. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for cybersecurity news.